I thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm Joe Supernaw, Director for Academic Engagement with the Lifelong Learning Team. And we're excited to have you join us for the Forever Learning Institute. This is a new educational opportunity delivered to you from the Lifelong Learning Team that is interdisciplinary and features some of Duke's best and brightest faculty, administrators, and alumni experts on a variety of topics. Um, we offer this in four thematically um, available courses. And today we're gonna be looking deeper at the human experience, which is an examination of what makes us unique in the world as people. And we're gonna be joined by two of my favorite people, Vanessa Woods and Brian Hare, co-directors of the K-9 Cognition Center here at Duke University and co-authors of The Genius of Dogs and their newest novel, which is called Survival of the Friendliness that we'll hear more about today. So. I'd like to invite uh, Vanessa and Brian to join us. Hello, everybody. So excited to be with you. And uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. And um, uh, this is really what makes Duke great is not just that we have all these marvelous students, but the alumni uh, stay involved and keep participating. And uh, Vanessa and I are uh, our plan is to give you uh, a talk that we've given uh, at the Smithsonian, we gave it at a Boston University, at the New York uh, uh, Museum of uh, Natural History. And it's a, a talk that really is about our new book, Survival of the Friendliness, but it draws on all the work we've done at Duke, uh, especially the work that's focused uh, more on human evolution and how animals can teach us about ourselves. So let me share uh, the slides, and then we can get started. Okay. So we called our book Survival of the Friendliest because we really wanted to take on this misconception of that I'm sure you all have heard before, survival of the fittest. And the idea is, behind that is that, you know, the toughest and the meanest and the most physically aggressive will win in nature and that somehow that should map onto the human experience. But actually, survival of the fittest was used uh, in Darwin's fifth edition of survival of the species. And what he meant by fitness was not anything to do with physical strength. Fitness is really just about your ability to reproduce. And that was where it, it stopped. So Charles Darwin was actually a really big fan of friendliness uh, and observed friendliness so often in nature. And because Friendliness is actually an amazing strategy. It's a great strategy, both for fitness in terms of your reproduction and also being able to not just survive, but thrive. So we have a couple of examples of friendliness as you see in nature. Um, the first one is flowers and pollinating insects. So flowers are actually relatively new on the, on the botany scene, um, but they've become one of the most, they've become the most successful plants because of their relationship where they're able to get pollinated by insects and they can spread their, spread their genes far and wide. The second example of friendliness that I really love because I've seen these guys in Antarctica and it is amazing. So emperor penguins are the only terrestrial vertebrate that can survive an Antarctic winter. It is so brutal and so cold. And they do this basically by cuddling all winter long. And it's the males that do this and it's really unusual in the animal kingdom. So emperor penguins, how wonderful. And the third example, which we really think encapsulates survival of the friendliness in, in terms of how it applies also to our research is the cleaner fish. So the cleaner wrasse is a small blue fish that lives on the Great Barrier Reef. And it is actually attracted to the mouths of predators. So the fear of predators has been replaced by an attraction and the cleaner rats will actually clean in between the teeth of predators who have this mutual understanding that they will not eat the cleaner fish. So you see this amazing relationship that's evolved there um, and showing that you know friendliness is a great strategy. So uh, 
really, if you take a big step back, what we're saying is, uh, if you ask the question, sort of what is the strategy that leads to the most evolutionary success? Uh, one candidate and arguably the most successful strategy is a new type of friendliness evolves that then allows for a new type of cooperation, some examples that Vanessa gave, uh, and that then allows uh, an organism or a set of organisms to flourish and actually outcompete uh, other organisms or maybe move into a new space where other organisms can't survive. So the penguins, for instance, are the only terrestrial vertebrates that live year round in Antarctica. And it's because they huddle and they are attracted to be close to each other and stay warm in the winter. Um, so what we wanna do now is talk about our own work where we came to realize the power of survival of the friendliest in explaining uh, both the evolution of dogs and bonobos, one of our two closest relatives, and how that may have shaped their psychology, and then what that teaches us about ourselves, and uh, perhaps the origin and success of our own species. Uh, these two uh, uh, wonderful animals, one our be best friend, one our closest relative, uh, can share about the origins of uh, Homo sapiens. All right, so I'm going to start by uh, talking about our work with dogs and sort of the model of where we think dogs come from, uh, how I ended up studying uh, sort of one of the big discoveries we made about dog psychology that then led us to this uh, idea in our own work about survival of friendliest. So uh, in this picture, I'm sitting with some juvenile wolves that we work with uh, in Minnesota. And we as Duke undergraduates, everything I'm gonna tell you about is, uh, work that Duke undergraduates participate in together with graduate students. And so one of the projects we've been working on for about seven, eight years is studying wolves and wolf uh, behavior and psychology. And in this picture, you can see that I've been sitting here for about an hour and these are juvenile wolves and they're not that excited about approaching. Um, and I actually have on the ground scattered some food, but they still don't really wanna be near me. And what we think happened during dog evolution and um, uh, really what caused uh, or sparked the evolution of dogs is that individual variability in uh, a wolf's propensity or um, a natural inclination to be attracted to humans um, uh, led to this dramatic change. So basically what I'm trying to tell you is the same thing that we saw in the cleaner rats where cleaner rats are attracted and not afraid of a predator, the same thing happened in the interaction between certain wolves that uh, had the ability to approach humans uh, and interact with us in a new way. And as a result of this uh, new attraction to humans that individual wolves could express, uh, you end up with a first stage of dog domestication, which is uh, a result of natural selection because individual wolves that could be attracted to humans could approach humans, they could take advantage of new resources Basically, they became scavengers instead of predators. They took advantage of garbage and other things around human settlements. Um, and it all occurred because of natural selection where individuals that had the ability to take advantage of this, they were uh, interacting and uh, breeding and reproducing. Uh, and they were not interacting in the same way with other wolves that were uh, afraid or too afraid and uh, continued to be predators. As a result, dogs are really one of the most successful species on the planet. There's over 100 million uh, dogs. If not, some calculations are a billion dogs. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, sadly, wolves, which are wonderful, uh, have been extirpated and are near extinction, sadly, uh, uh, or heavily endangered everywhere where they uh, remain. Um, so there's this interesting question of how the species could have been so successful. And we think the story is one of friendliness. Now. One of the major insights about why we think this could have happened uh, is that we know from genomic work that wolves uh, began to evolve into dogs, a population or a set of wolves began to, pop, to evolve into dogs 25 to 40,000 years ago. Well, no one was living with agriculture or obviously industrialization uh, at that time. So every human being that was alive was a hunter-gatherer or a forager. The, this picture is a picture uh, of Hadza foragers in Tanzania, for instance. Um, and so it would have been interactions with foraging humans 
uh, that would have led to this initial stage of natural selection. Now, then after this initial stage, uh, literally thousands and thousands and thousands of years later, the more familiar thing would have occurred, which is artificial selection would have led to the European breeds. This is my childhood pet dog who's a Labrador retriever. But if we were to travel back two to 300 years, there were just a handful of breeds that had been artificially selected. Most of the breeds that we recognize today, their origin traces back to just 100, 150 years ago. Um, and uh, not only do we know from historical records, but also from gene uh, genetic work that that's the case. So really what I'm trying to tell you is that dogs are a story of survival of the friendliest, and this all occurred very recently. Now, my own story with dogs and what led me to this idea was really uh, trying to unlock their psychology. And um, it was really started with my own pet dog, uh, who was really good when we played fetch at uh, if he lost a ball, understanding if I gestured to him uh, where to go search for the ball. But I'm going to let uh, Anderson Cooper explain to you why this uh, is so important uh, and why it was so interesting that my pet dog and your pet dog and most dogs do this. He's talking about what researchers call social inference, a capability humans like her son Luke acquire around age one. Okay. To demonstrate the concept, Hare hides a ball under one of these two cups. Hey, looky guy, where is it? Can you get it? Can you get the ball? Luke doesn't know which cup the ball is under. Can you get it? But when his father points, he makes an inference. Hey, <laughs> nice job. You got I'm it. Tired so what does that show you? So when kids his age start understanding pointing, it's right when um, the foundations of what lead to language and culture start to develop. It might look simple, but when Hare tried the same test with bonobos, great apes he studied for more than a decade, look what happened. Bonobos, our closest genetic relatives, can't do it. You chose the wrong one! But Hare discovered dogs can. You ready? All right, I'm going to hide in one of these two places. This two-year-old Labrador named Sisu has no trouble understanding the meaning of pointing. Now, she doesn't know for sure which place you put That's it. right. There's no way she could know, and I'm just going to tell her where it is. Okay, Sisu. So at some point in all of our lives, between nine and 12 months of age, we all began to understand that when someone gestures, points, or looks in a certain direction, that inside their minds, they have the intention to communicate in a cooperative way. They're trying to help us. Uh, and so we start to understand that around nine to 12 months. And when that develops, that allows for a new form of communication uh, and it opens up a window into a cultural world where we can learn all sorts of things and stand on the shoulders of giants for many generations before. And eventually we acquire language through a process of interacting in a way, uh, inter, inter, sorry, inter, uh, interacting and communicating in this intentional way. And so gestural communication is thought to be really the first indicator of this journey towards uh, all the social abilities that make us human and uh, it's in dogs. Uh, this first critical developmental uh, um, ability uh, and it's not uh, in our closest primate relatives, chimpanzees and bonobos. So that was a big surprise. Uh, why would a distant relative uh, so distant have this really interesting ability that's critical to potentially uh, being human. Well, if you're somebody who's trying to understand where human psychology comes from and its origin, well, this becomes totally a fascinating question because if we can figure out how it happened in dogs, maybe that can give us some inference about ourselves. So in the hopes of trying to uh, unlock the answer to how dogs might have this ability, uh, I had to go to Siberia. And I had to go to Siberia because uh, an experiment began there in uh, 1959 uh, by uh, a scientist named Dmitry Belayev and colleagues uh, um, Irina Plyasnina and Ludmilla Trutt. And they began selecting a population of foxes to be friendly towards humans. So uh, at about seven months, they would stand in front of all the foxes. And if they approached and wanted to interact and be friendly and maybe even be held by a person or pet, uh, they would breed those foxes together if they were fearful or, or tried to run away or maybe even try to bite you if you touched them, then they didn't breed those foxes. 
And at the same time, they kept a control line, a control population that they bred randomly for how they interacted with humans. And then they compared what this selection did uh, to the behavior of the foxes. But the surprise is, of course, uh, no surprise is that they, each generation, the foxes became much and much and much and much friendlier to the point now where when I actually got to go study them, uh, they wag their tails, they cry, they, you know, they, they cry when they see humans, they desperately want to be held and uh, nuzzle and they're, you know, pretty adorable. Um, but the surprise was that a whole bunch of other things changed that they didn't intentionally select. So the appearance of the fox has changed. So they have all these different coat colors, for instance, depicted here. They have uh, the friendlier foxes have a higher prevalence of floppy ears. They have a higher prevalence of curly tails, shorter tails, and they have shorter muzzles. Their sort of their, their faces have become shorter um, and their canine teeth have actually become reduced in size. Um, so all of this happened and we can attribute it directly to the selection for friendliness because we can compare to the control line and know that they didn't change in the same way. So the only thing that's different between the two lines is the selection. And the mechanism that we think links all these things together, because at first it makes no sense. Why would morphology change? Why would um, other traits of the foxes change if you're selecting for friendliness? And we know that uh, now that it has to do with early fetal development in these foxes. The selection for friendliness changes how uh, early fetal development occurs, how hormones express themselves in early uh, fetal development. Uh, and that those hormones that have to change in order to alter uh, behavior, they're heavily involved in growth of faces and growth of tails and ears and things like this. And so if you change behavior, you change the morphology as well. The other surprise was when I went to study the foxes, I played the same games that you saw with the cups and stuff that Anderson Cooper and I were doing with the foxes. And it ends up that only the friendly foxes pass the test and the control foxes are like uh, chimpanzees and bonobos. Um, and we know from this experiment that when you select for friendliness, not only do you get all these morphological changes, but you also get more clever foxes. They're socially more clever like dogs in the sense that they understand our gestures and they have evolved the same ability we see in dogs. So selection for friendliness does a lot. Uh, not only does it change what you look like in some cases, but it changes uh, your ability to cooperate and communicate. So, whoa, so cool. Uh, and uh, so that's why we got so excited about thinking about that stage one, stage two model and how it may explain more than just dogs and wolves, um, which we uh, applied. And we think that the reason dogs have this social genius is because of selection for friendliness that I already laid out due to natural selection. But if that can happen, if natural selection could happen in the case of dog evolution, why can't we think about other species as well? And we started to look around the natural world and say, okay, are there any other species we might explain? And it ends up that bonobos, one of our two closest relatives, uh, uh, bonobos and chimpanzees are like sister taxa. Um, it's like having two first cousins. Uh, one's a girl, one's a boy. They're equally closely related because they're both first cousins to you, but they're different from each other. And that's how bonobos and chimpanzees are to us. Um, and we started to think maybe this friendliness model might apply there. And also we started to think about our own species. So now uh, I'm gonna hand it back to Vanessa to tell you about a little bit of our work that uh, we use to test this idea that maybe bonobos have been selected for friendliness. So the big surprise is that friendliness, selection for friendliness is so powerful that it changes a whole lot of other features, including physical features. So as Brian said, that then we could look at the natural world and see and look for these physical features and see if there'd been selection for friendliness and what that might mean to changes in their physiology and cognition. So bonobos and chimpanzees are so interesting because they are so closely related to us. They share 98.7% of our DNA. And really that they are our closest living relatives. Um, and I, just love bonobos. But when we show you this video, I'm a big fan. Um, so when we show you this video, see if you can see some of the physical features that have changed between bonobos and chimpanzees and what that might mean. So, yeah. 
chimpanzees and bonobos are actually more closely related to us genetically than they are to gorillas. Really, genetically, they're 99% human. That then led me to wonder, are they capable of hate? Or is it how we can hate one another really special about us? Bonobos and chimpanzees are fascinating because they are very similar to one another. They have rich social relationships. They have long-term bonds with each other. They eat much of the same stuff. But what makes the two species so interesting to study is how they're different. And they're different in ways that are so fundamental to understanding ourselves. You really can't tell the difference between chimpanzees and bonobos just by looking at them. They look almost the same. I couldn't tell the chimpanzee from the bonobo when I first started. The differences really come when you watch their behavior and see the way their societies are made up. I think most people are more familiar with chimpanzees. They're male dominated and females have to endure a lot of aggression from males. In chimpanzees, aggression is very much to establish dominance and maintain control. So if an alpha male comes in, the first thing he'll do is he'll kill all the babies. Bonobos have none of them. They are female dominated and infants and babies are almost never harmed. So it, it, it's difficult to tell, um, but some of the changes that we saw in both dogs from wolves and then the experimental foxes, the friendly foxes from the control foxes was these kind of like shorter faces um, and a change in pigmentation. And you will see that between bonobos and chimpanzees, but not only that, but that chimpanzees have a lot heavier brow ridges. Um, testosterone is one of those neurohormones that actually changes the shape of your skull. And um, yet yeah, chimpanzees have heavier brow ridges and bonobos, they just have flatter, friendlier faces. So there has been intense selection for friendliness in bonobos and just how friendly we can see with some of the experiments that we did at a bonobo sanctuary called Lolea Bonobo in Congo. So this is based on the dictator game and it is uh, sort of generally that, you know, if you give someone $100 and then uh, see who they um, will share with, well, number one, the surprise with humans is that if there is a stranger in the next room, they will actually share across cultures about half of that hundred dollars, which was such a surprise to economists because why would you share any of your money with a stranger who you will never see again? And um, so that was one of the sort of big findings that was said to be the basis of human altruism, like charity and donating blood and everything else that makes us wonderful. So the, the switch is that if there is a stranger and a, and, a, and a group mate, like a friend, who would you share your money with? And it is usually that uh, we find that humans will prefer to share with their friends than a stranger, which totally makes sense. But with bonobos, selection for friendliness has been so powerful that they prefer to share with strangers. They are friendlier than we are when it comes to deciding between strangers and group mates. And this selection for friendliness has actually affected their fitness. So I'm just gonna show you a quick video of what the experiment looks like. And then we'll talk about how this affects, um, affects the number of offspring they have. So this is Saki, she's coming in to get her $100, which is breakfast. And that's a link here in the next room. She's seen before, but doesn't know very well. And she will actually open the door and let him in so they can eat together. Oh my God. Sharing is fun. Sharing, sharing is so fun. And this would, we, we couldn't even do this with chimpanzees because chimpanzees would never share food like this. And what we, what other researchers have found is that the most despotic, the most aggressive chimpanzee males has 
fewer offspring than the friendliest bonobo male. So this intense selection for friendliness in bonobos has not only changed the way they look, it's not only changed their physiology, but it's actually affected their fitness as well. And we found that um, bonobos are better cooperators than chimpanzees just because they're more tolerant. So what we're arguing is basically the foxes suggest that selection for friendliness has changes throughout the body and even mind. Um, and that natural selection uh, can be seen to cause selection for friendliness as Darwin anticipated in that quote we started with. Uh, and how that happens is if there's a cost benefit. So one of the things that's not very well appreciated, and in fact, my colleague uh, at Duke, uh, Jenny Tung and uh, Susan Alberts, who are both in evolutionary anthropology, uh, they've very nicely demonstrated in baboons that they study in Kenya that it's very, very costly uh, to be a dominant male. Um, it takes a lot of energy. It actually is very taxing on the immune system. Um, and in the cases of baboons, that that cost is actually compensated by the benefit of being dominant. But if that benefit is reduced, then it, the cost becomes too high and actually selection switches and favors friendliness and friendliness uh, in the case of bonobos, for instance, in uh, males. Um, and so uh, what we think happened in bonobos is there was sexual selection, that females actually prefer friendlier males um, and that all the cascading effects we saw in the foxes occurred uh, in the bonobos as a result. So that is our closest relative that this has occurred in. And then uh, you have to then start to wonder about, wait a second, if this can happen in bonobos, uh, what about human evolution? And there's a big problem that is a new problem in uh, understanding human evolution. And the new problem is that over the last 10 to 15 years, as more fossils have been discovered uh, and more genomic data has come in from studies of ancient DNA, what we've come to realize is that we, Homo sapiens, were not alone until very recently evolutionarily. So probably we were not alone as the last human species until 50 or maybe even 25,000 years ago. Before 50,000 years, and definitely at 100,000 years ago, there were many other human species on the planet Earth. The other thing is that all of the species, they're depicted here, all these would have been alive at 100,000 years ago. All of these species had big brains. They left cultural artifacts, and meaning they had cultural traditions and uh, uh, sophisticated um, uh, culture that we would recognize. And uh, there's even some suggestion and evidence that they were linguistic uh, and linguistic in ways that we would recognize as well. Uh, perhaps they don't have full human language, but they would have been able to communicate in pretty sophisticated ways relative to other animals. Well, all those traits, big brains, culture, and language are what, if you ask any person on the street, what makes humans different from animals, you would list. But, and that's why we're so successful. The problem is, if there were five of us 100,000 years ago, and there's only one of us now, how can it be that those three things explain success in humans? Because those were all human species and they're now extinct. So it had to be something else in addition to those things that led to the success of our species and our survival. Uh, and we think uh, it was a new type of friendliness that led to new forms of cooperation. And what we propose in Survival of the Friendliest is uh, that that new form of friendliness uh, is depicted best here by Cameron Crazies. So what are Cameron crazies? They are strangers who uh, had never met until they were fully adult, 18 plus. Uh, and they're from all over the world, all over the country. Uh, they have all sorts of different uh, beliefs, experiences, et cetera. But they all become one thing when they are introduced to this common cultural identity of being a Duke Blue Devil. And they have this you know, uh, cultural behaviors, rituals, of uh, you know, hanging out in tents for a long time and then rooting like crazy for the Duke Blue Devils uh, in Cameron. And so uh, it's a perfect example of the social category that does not exist in other animals. Only humans, and I think of the human species that exist, I think we are the only species that ever evolved what we're calling in-group strangers. 
So a stranger who's actually in your group that you recognize as part of your group, but you've never met before. Other species, that's not the case. Even bonobos, when they see a stranger, they're just attracted to strangers. They don't recognize them as sharing their identity, their cultural group identity. Uh, other animals don't have identity uh, of groups. They recognize familiar and unfamiliar individuals, not identities of different groups. So uh, the Cameron Crazies represent this new form of friendliness where we can instantly become friends with someone who shares some social identity, whether it's a language or a food or a, a, a dress, a tattoo, whatever it is, we connect through that identity and we become fast friends. We can start caring about strangers as if they are families. It can be that uh, family members, it can become that intense, even though we're totally unrelated. No other species. What does that do for us? Well, the idea would be that if each of these faces uh, represents a group member, or sorry, a different group of human, if this was the other species of humans, the different groups representing here, uh, well, they wouldn't be interacting with their neighboring groups very much. If this is group one, group two, they might interact, maybe group three, four interact, but there's very little interaction between the groups. What does that do? It means there's not much information being transmitted. It means that if there's an innovation that occurs in one group, it's not going to spread to the next. And it means that technology and knowledge can't build on itself very quickly relative to if all the groups are exchanging information. And as soon as you have in-group strangers and cultural, or I should say, sorry, group identity, then information can transmit very fast because you've formed friendships with strangers, uh, your neighbors around you, and you don't have a xenophobic response necessarily, as long as you have some kind of group identity you recognize, you can very quickly form friendships with strangers, just like Cameron Crazies. And that is the unique friendliness that we find in our species and no other. Some evidence that we've generated to support this idea that there was selection for friendliness late in human evolution, uh, together with Steve Churchill and Bob Sari, who was a honors thesis, uh, a, a senior undergraduate honors thesis, is we looked at human skulls and faces uh, before and after we think this selection occurred for friendliness, and we looked at some of the facial features that change when you select animals for friendliness, and we see sort of that same uh, impact of that selection. So. Uh, if you look at modern humans, we have a much reduced brow ridge. We have much shorter faces, narrower faces. It's exactly what happened in the foxes. Similar things uh, you have been observed in other species, even bonobos. Uh, and then the other thing is, well, what's our curly tail or our different colored coat? And I think it's our white sclera, the whites of our eyes. It ends up at the same uh, cell types and uh, genetics that are involved in changing your face structure and um, the shape of your brows and even the shape of your skull, uh, those same cells are involved in creating the tissue uh, that is your sclera, the white part of your eye. Every other primate species has dark sclera. They hide their sclera. We're the only species that advertises. And of course, we have different colored pupils that even further accentuate our eyes. Um, uh, also, by the way, the only other species we see that in our domesticated animals. Um, so what I'm suggesting is that only humans have white sclera. Every human you'll ever meet has white sclera. And I think that feature evolved late in human evolution as a result of selection for friendliness. So that means if we went back even 150,000 years ago, this is who you would meet. You would meet another human that if I put these chimpanzee eyes on top of their face, this is what you'd be staring uh, at. It would not be uh, you know, the white sclera that your brain actually has uh, cells to recognize um, automatically uh, without um, involuntarily, uh, your brain recognizes white sclera and encodes that as, oh, that's another human. Um, that would not have been the reaction your brain would have been able to have 150,000 years ago. I think these sclera evolved as a result of selection for friendliness. And not only does it help us to recognize other humans, but it accentuates and enhances our ability to cooperate. We know with different experiments that if humans have white sclera as they're being asked to cooperate, they become more cooperative if they feel like eyes with white sclera are watching them or watching us as we make different decisions about working together. All right, so I just told you the story. Humans are so friendly. Uh, and we're the friendliest human species uh, to ever evolve. Um, and uh, I would argue that the evidence is overwhelming that that is the case. 
but I also, we also read the news uh, and it's all relative. We're friendlier relative to the extinct species of humans. And we think that this hypothesis actually also helps us explain the paradox of uh, human nature. So we actually call this hypothesis the mama bear hypothesis because when is a mother bear the most loving, the most kind and the most patient is when she's with her cubs. But when is she also the most dangerous? And uh, this is Brian in front of a polar bear in California. And it is actually at that same moment when she is defending and protecting her cubs. You do not want to get in between a mama bear and her babies. So when Brian was talking about this new group identity that is only in humans, it's our ability to see someone that we've never met before and for us to identify them as being part of our group. So as Brian mentioned, chimpanzees and bonobos, they don't do this. Like a stranger is someone who lives outside your territory and, and, and a group mate is somebody that you're familiar with and that's it. But with humans, with our ability to recognize and just instantly connect with and be prepared to cooperate with these in-group strangers, it means that we are also prepared to defend them against outside threats. And this becomes especially relevant when those outside threats happen to be another group of humans. And by that, I mean homo sapien humans, not the extinct humans. So this is another misconception in evolutionary anthropology, just like survival of the fittest. It is called, this drawing is called the ascent of man. And the idea behind it is that, you know, evolution is a nice straight line that, you know, starts at sea sponges and ends up with humans that we're the pinnacle of evolution. Of course, this is not how evolution, even human evolution happens. It, it's super messy. There's lots of branches. It's more of kind of like a tangled bush. But this is really an important and effective graphic when it comes to measuring how human you regard other groups as people as. So this is actual research. Uh, people are posed this question and it is says, using the sliders below, indicate how evolved you can see, con consider each of the following individuals or groups. And then we have groups from um, different, different cultures and countries. And so the obvious answer is that everybody's human. Everybody's fully human. Everybody is completely and 100% a human. But actually, if you ask one group of people how evolved these other groups of people are, you might get something like this. And then if you ask a different group of people how evolved other groups are, you might get something like this. So what researchers have found is that in all groups of people, some proportion are likely to dehumanize uh, what we call outsiders. And um, they dehumanize them with varying degrees. It, it, it's a scale, as you can see here. But we call this dehumanization because you are looking at another group of humans as though they are less than human. And when that happens, um, then that's when you are most likely to cause them, them harm. And, uh, you know, there's been different theories about this. Some say that, uh, you know, there are certain groups of humans who are more likely to dehumanize than others. But actually, if you look at the last 200 years um, and uh, places in the world where genocide or democide, and, and democide is genocide that is sanctioned officially by a political party or by the government, you'll see that it is all over the world. And this is just in the last 200 years. Um, and you know, if you go back even like another few decades, you'll see uh, genocides occurring in places like Canada and then other parts of um, the African continent. So what we see is that really just as our ability to see strangers as part of our group, as part of our family, is a universal human trait, then also is the ability to dehumanize outsiders when we feel that our in-group is threatened. So just to, uh, you know, sort of go back, because it's so complicated, uh, there's a lot there. Um, the argument is that there's been selection for friendliness, uh, that um, humans uh, are the kindest human species that ever evolved. But because we care about those in our group that share our identity, whatever that identity is, it's totally plastic. Um, it can almost be anything. Uh, we then can, we have the potential 
to be the cruelest species because the same abilities, the same psychological abilities that allow us to understand and have empathy and care about those who share our identity and do all the compassionate things we like to celebrate, those cognitive abilities can be shut down if we feel like our group is being threatened and especially if we feel they're being dehumanized. And that then leads to moral exclusion of the groups that we feel are threatening our own uh, especially if we feel like our group is being dehumanized. The number one thing that predicts dehumanization is if you feel your identity is being dehumanized. Um, and so those same abilities that allow for empathy, perspective taking, compassion, they all get dampened and shut down towards other human beings uh, who we feel uh, or perceive as a threat to our own identity. And so then that's what then allows uh, humans uh, psychologically to morally exclude and then do the most horrific things that history has shown we're capable of. So uh, the hypothesis, I think, helps uh, us explain uh, this uh, oddity of human nature or unfortunate piece of human nature, unfortunate being understatement. Um, and so then that leads to the next part of our book that we took on, which is, all right, well, that's nice to know that about human nature, nice hypothesis, and enjoy your basic research trying to understand that, but what can we do about it? Uh, how can we have a friendlier future? Uh, and so this is a picture of, uh, you know, a famous sequence from uh, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood during a time during uh, integration where uh, horrific attacks were happening on people integrating uh, public swimming pools. Um, and this was his response saying that in our neighborhood, I'm friends with uh, people, African Americans, uh, other uh, identities are my friends. Um, and, uh, you know, we are all the same uh, piece of humanity. Uh, and so uh, it's a very simple, kind uh, gesture that these two made. Uh, and it actually is absolutely uh, a symbol of the main scientific hypothesis called the con contact theory um, that, uh, that basically ha has shown that this is one of the best uh, responses to um, uh, prevent, preclude, or uh, immunize against uh, the potential for dehumanization. And that is cross-group friendships. When people from different groups see that uh, people within their uh, group have friendships across different groups, it reduces the potential for dehumanization and, and potentially prejudice. Uh, and it is uh, most powerfully uh, it's the most powerful strategy that's been demonstrated to do such. So uh, Sarah Gaither, who is a professor in psychology and neuroscience at Duke, we collaborate with her as well. She is actually involved in research in this exact topic. Uh, and it's why Duke, I think, has wisely randomized uh, first year dorm room selection uh, to try to make sure that people uh, meet and interact and become cross-group friendships with as diverse a group of people as possible. Uh, in their first year at Duke because it's been shown to have such a powerful effect uh, on humanizing and um, uh, increasing friendliness and cooperative behavior across large groups. Uh, in our book, the next thing we, we uh, take on is uh, democracy. And the argument is that um, we didn't evolve to be despots, that uh, forging uh, populations and the cross-cultural samples of the hundreds of groups of hunter-gatherers and, and foragers that have been studied uh, they are not uh, despotic, and in fact, there is a recent book arguing that democracy is an old uh, social strategy and uh, more common than it had been recognized, and that it is the most powerful way uh, to have large groups of people where, especially when you have societies the size that we have now of millions and billions, to have uh, where you need decision makers and some form of hierarchy, it's the only system that's ever been devised that allows uh, both hierarchy and egalitarian principles to coexist, where when you're, out of, when you're out of power, you still have a voice and you can come back into power, peaceful transitions of power, et cetera. Um, so with all her flaws, democracy, we, we, we spent a lot of time in the book uh, trying to make an argument about its evolution, its power, and uh, why it is really uh, critical for a friendlier future. Um, and then the final one that's a little counterintuitive is actually how we perceive animals is relevant to how we perceive each other. There's some very nice data showing 
uh, that um, uh, one of the things that predicts people's tendency to have prejudice or dehumanize um, or have a tendency to have a xenophobic response uh, to strangers is how they perceive the natural world and other animals. People who have a more hierarchical view that humans are sort of on top and animals are something separate and different and below, uh, they tend to have, uh, they're more susceptible to um, antisocial responses to uh, different groups of people. Um, uh, people who have a more ecological view that humans are just another species um, and that we are different, but all species are different. Uh, these people seem to be a little bit more robust against uh, the potential for uh, dehumanization, prejudice, and other types of antisocial responses to strangers. So our, our research group and my graduate student, who actually is a graduate of Duke Kunshan University, her name is Win Zhou, and she's just about to finish her PhD, and she's been really focused on this, uh, how we perceive animals and how it's related to dehumanization and uh, it's thanks to all the resources at Duke that we even met in China when Vanessa and I went to teach there uh, and that she's then been doing the, all the work that she's been doing. So um, uh, the book really wraps up trying to make the case that there are real solutions. They're not expensive. They uh, are, might be psychologically taxing, but they're possible. And there's wonderful, powerful evidence uh, that really points us in the direction of uh, strategies that we know work. Um, and so uh, I hope you uh, get a chance to uh, pick up the book, give it a read and see what you think. Um, and uh, I think Vanessa wants to take it, it back over and tell you a little bit more about our applied work that we're doing now because it's fun and uplifting. Uh, so I'll hand it back to you and I'll, while you're talking, maybe I'll switch yeah, the yeah, sure, share sure, slide. Sure, sure. Okay. So we have to end up on um, how puppies will save the world. Um, if this kind of hierarchical view of nature, if it's so important to sort of like bridge the distance between species and show how humans are not better than other animals, um, that we are, you know, all part of this ecosystem and contact uh, or making friends between two different groups is so powerful, then, then what other animal is there that is more likely to bridge the divide between humans and other species than our dogs? So we run the Duke Puppy Kindergarten, which is part of the Canine Cognition Center, and we are trying to help graduate more dogs um, as assistance dogs to help more people. So this is a, a nice Duke summary of our work. Thank you so much, everyone. Come and visit us at the Puppy Kindergarten in the fall, and hopefully we can all be together sometime very soon. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's it's a, a pleasure to do these events and so fun. I, I'm looking forward to interacting with you in person in the future. We love hanging out with alums. Uh, and uh, um, uh, with that, we will uh, end our presentation. Thank you much. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much. That was so enjoyable. And, it, you know, like hearing more about um, not just how dogs have capitalized on their friendliness, but also how we as people have started to um, shift in, in our ancestry with that same 
uh, thing is is really just absolutely fascinating. So thank you so much for the presentation today. We're gonna jump into a little bit of Q&A. We have about 10 minutes. So I'm gonna go right to the chat and ask you guys some questions. Um, Molly Grace asked us, uh, when does behavior cross the line from simply being mutually beneficial into being friendly? You'd like to, you do a good job defining friendliness. Well, so when we're talking about what we see in nature, we really use this really broad brush for friendliness. It's, it can be anything as simple as wanting to, re re uh, wanting to interact, to um, just having a mutually beneficial relationship that doesn't require a brain at all, uh, to something really sophisticated like what we see in human friendliness and cooperation, where there's lots of you know mind reading and reading of intentions. So really, friendliness is just this this incredibly broad uh, definition that we use, and it's just it's just any kind of pro-social behavior. Great. So we had um we had some questions from Nancy, who's class of 1980, and she wanted to know a little bit more about recognizing in-group strangers and how that applies to maybe some other species outside of dogs, chimpanzees, bonobos, and humans, um, such as do cows recognize in-group strangers? Um, other animals don't don't dogs actually recognize strangers that aren't part of their group? Can you speak a little bit more on that? You that no, you you so, so the idea is that uh, animals definitely recognize strangers and they definitely respond to strangers. Um, uh, everything from cows to dogs to bonobos uh, to, I mean, I'm sure there are, uh, you know, invertebrates that recognize uh, strangers. In fact, there's some species of wasp that recognize faces. But the argument I, that we make is that that's all based on familiarity. So I've, I have experience with you, I have seen you before, uh, and if I have experienced you and I'm familiar with you, you are part of my group. And it's all, group is I'm familiar with you, not group is I'm unfamiliar with you. So different species find unfamiliar threatening uh, or uh, something uh, to seek out. In the case of chimpanzees, unfamiliar is very threatening, they're very xenophobic. Uh, they murder one another. Uh, and bonobos, uh, strangers or the unfamiliar are attractive. They wanna interact with strangers. And in fact, the most attractive social partner is a young female from another group that comes in uh, and interacts uh, and wants to join the group. Whereas chimpanzees are very aggressive to that stranger. Humans, what we're arguing is that we all have this concept of, for instance, I grew up as a southerner. I, I have this concept of what a Southerner is and that, oh, when I see somebody who displays something that I see, oh, they're drinking iced tea. Oh, that might be a Southerner. Uh, and I can instantly connect with them about that. Um, and so that's a group identity. Animals don't have that. They don't have anything like group identity. And when that evolves in our species, that allows us to connect and form much larger groups and be friendlier towards groups that other species of humans couldn't be friendly with. Thank you. Uh, Harry Gawanter asks, since Homo sapiens were dominant about 25,000 years ago, and that seems to be about the same time that wolves became more dog-like, can we infer that dogs helped us um, become a more dominant primate species? <laughs> <laughs> that is a really, that's a really interesting question. And Pat Shipman would argue that dogs as uh, hunters, um, dogs as guards, dogs performed this, this whole variety of tasks that might have helped us become uh, friendlier. But uh, uh, whether, whether or not this kind of like happened when we were already dominant or whether it helped, you know, us push other species to extinction, I'm not, I'm not sure we know that. Do you know that? Well, I mean, that's a fun place for debate. There's certainly people who have made the case that dogs played an instrumental role in helping humans outcompete and outsurvive the last Neanderthals. Um, uh, and so that's been a fun uh, debate. Uh, I'm not, I mean, I, I'm quite open to that idea, um, but I think it's early in um, terms of the evidence there is available to sort of test that thinking. And just a few more minutes left, um, but actually wanted to ask, 
you know, you guys shared so much about the next steps and where you're hoping your research will lead in, in the near future. But I'm, you know, I'm also wondering too, and maybe people from our audience as well, you know, what's sort of the, the wide open door to this research? What, what are possibilities that um, maybe aren't in the near future that this could start to lead towards? Uh, well, are you okay if I- Peace on earth. <laughs> <laughs> I like that, I yeah, like that, that's peace. good, that's yes. good. Um, yeah, just cross your, cross your paws. Um, no, I, I think if you were to ask me, like, what's the number one thing I would do after we did all the research and wrote the book and all that kind of stuff, my number one, it wouldn't cost much money and it would have huge impact in, in trying to prevent dehumanization uh, and uh, protect uh, our democratic institutions. It's a very small thing, actually. I would uh, try to develop a program so that congressional staffers go to lunch together. And repeatedly, uh, you know, you you incentivize cross group friendships between young Republican staffers and young Democratic staffers, so that those friendships act as bridges long into the future. These are all future uh, lawyers, judges, uh, politicians, um, and we certainly don't want them to leave Washington thinking that the other side aren't uh, people you can be friends with. Uh, and if we could just do that, that would uh, reduce, uh, let's say immunize, since we're in a pandemic, immunize against uh, the worst of human nature. Is it gonna, it's not gonna fix all the problems, but I definitely wanna immunize against dehumanization if I can. Well, both of you, thank you so much. Thank you for this wonderful talk today and for answering our questions. Um, again, this was, uh, just an absolutely lovely and amazing conversation. For those of you in our audience, thank you for joining us from literally all over the world today. Uh, it's so exciting to have you here and to be part of the Forever Learning Institute. The next session will be next week with Professor Bill Adair from the Stanford School of Public Policy. And we're looking at how to stay informed and in, um, being a civically engaged citizen in your community.